Uh, welcome to, uh, uh, to this, uh, this session. Uh, we, are, we are very happy to, uh, uh, to have uh, uh, Professor uh, John Sturman, uh, who has many titles. Uh, Jay Forrester, Professor of Management at the MIT Sloan School of Management, uh, Professor uh, of uh, MIT Institute for, for Data System and Society, and I think the probably today uh, most relevant director of a sustainability initiative, uh, who uh, and and uh, he has uh, kindly offered to uh, share his uh, his his, his uh, uh, knowledge uh, and 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 the system uh, on en roads. Uh, here now, our vice president uh, Motohiro Tsuchiya is uh, here to uh, to to welcome the team. So uh, may I invite Tsuchiya-san? Thank you very much. So, uh, Professor John Sturman. So, welcome to Keio University. So, according to your internet homepage, your office is building E62 uh, at MIT campus in Cambridge, Massachusetts. My shared office was in building E38 in 2009 to 2000, uh, 2008 to 2009, 16 years ago. Um, it was just four minutes walk from mine to yours, but. Uh, I spent many hours at the Dewey Library, which was closer to your office. I was not a MIT student, but I was a, just a visiting scholar at the MIT Center for International Studies. But when I was there, um, I realized people were praising MIT Sloan School very much. It's a world's leading uh, business school. It's a pity that we didn't know each other when, when I was close to you. But probably we crossed on the street. Um, maybe we breathed uh, the same air in a cafe, uh, but the air was very, very cold in winter in Cambridge, actually. But why did I go to MIT for my sabbatical year? Because one of my supervisors uh, was from MIT. So Professor Taizo Yakshiji uh, is a political scientist, and he received uh, his PhD at MIT in 1977. After coming back to KO, he taught system dynamics at his class, and I learned it. It was a very, very exciting moment for me. So um, one of the software I used for the first time was Stellar. So it's a kind of commercial package of system dynamics. It's still available at the KO Seiko store, Coop store, actually. So um, students, including me, were very, very excited to learn uh, system dynamics. And so it allowed us to understand how the world is connected and how many, many factors are um, affecting each other. Uh, Professor Stanton is the director of the MIT System Dynamics Group and the MIT Sloan Sustainability Initiative, as Professor Kokuro said. It is our great honor to have you uh, uh, Professor Stroman here at Keio University and hold a seminar like this. I have not touched upon system dynamics for a while, but so I want to listen to your lecture as I came back to a student again. So Professor Stroman, thank you for um, coming to Keio University and sharing your thoughts um, uh, with us. And I also want to thank Professor Jiro Kokuro, my predecessor as Vice President for Global Engagement. And so I want to uh, thank our KO colleagues, students, and so um, uh, other people to come in here. So let's enjoy our discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tsuchiya san. Uh, let, before, before the actual event begins, let me I invite just one more person uh, to, uh, to, to deliver. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to uh, invite uh, Cecilia Mellon who is uh, the MIT Sloan Sustainability Advisory Board member. Mm -hmm. And uh, she, it's, it's actually uh, Cecilia who arranged uh, all of this. So thank you very much. Yes, it's my, it's my pleasure to uh, also welcome uh, John Sturman here to Tokyo today. And uh, uh, I'm an advisory board member. I, I live in Tokyo, and I, I'm an investor, an equity investor. I run a a fund uh, investing in technology and in sustainability. And uh, sustainability is uh, a cause that's very near, close to my heart, and that's why I got involved with the uh, 
the advisory board and uh, it's such an important issue and you can observe in Tokyo every day now it's uh, January but it's so nice outside and it's uh, it's a little bit too warm actually <laughs> it used to be like uh, uh, even 15 years ago, it would maybe be only one degree or two degrees now in January and it would snow and there's maybe no more snow in Tokyo anymore. So with that in mind, let's welcome uh, Professor Sturmer. Thank, thank you very much. Now, yes. Well, thank you all. Thank you all very much. I'm very pleased to be here back in Japan and here at KO for the first time. And this is going to be a very different kind of session than maybe you're used to. It's not going to be a lecture. You're all, this is actually on. Yes. Yes. Uh, you're all going to tell me how to solve the climate crisis. So actually, before we begin, how many of you are students? Just raise your hand if you're a student. Wonderful. Faculty? Other kinds of uh, researchers or administrators? Okay, great. So the first thing I want to say is this is going to be a fully interactive session and I want you, I need you to ask questions anytime. We're not going to wait until the end to have questions. You should just raise your hand and uh, ask anything you want and you should challenge me. You should say, I don't think what you just said is right or I don't think your simulation is doing the right thing. All models are imperfect, including the En-ROADS model that you're going to work with today. And so challenge it. Tell us what you think is missing or needs improvement or has to be changed. This is actually a serious request and it's extremely important for us. Go ahead. Uh, one thing I should, I, I forgot to tell you, this, this session is uh, videotaped and will be on, uh, on KO homepage. So in case there's anybody who wish to be deleted, <laughs> uh, I, we'll, we'll accept that uh, uh, request. So, uh, but, but, so, so feel free to, um, to, to, to enjoy the engagement. Excuse me. Wait, no problem, thank you very much, that's an important important announcement. So, I'm very serious about this. I want you to challenge me. Don't be shy. And since I am a professor at the Sloan School of Management, and uh, that means in business schools, we call on the students with no warning. And so I may point my finger at you and say, can you tell me what you think about that issue? Or what do you think we should do to solve the climate crisis? And I don't know if that is a common behavior here, but that's the way it works. So for today, imagine you're at the MIT Sloan School. Okay, so what are we gonna do? We're gonna use the En-ROAD simulation model, which we have developed in my group, the Sloan Sustainability Initiative, in partnership with Climate Interactive. Climate Interactive is a nonprofit NGO that was founded by two alumni of MIT, uh, including one of my former students, who's the director now, and we work extremely closely with them. They get uh, all this credit for developing what you're going to work with today uh, along with our team. So here's what I'm not gonna do today. I am not going to tell you about the science of climate change. There is no credible doubt that the climate is changing. It's getting warmer, no snow in Tokyo anymore, for example that that global warming and climate change is caused by us, by human activity, especially burning fossil fuels, and that climate change poses grave risks to prosperity, to security, to our health, and even our lives. This is not in doubt. I'm not gonna talk about it. Ask me anything you want, but that's not the problem. The problem is there is no agreement about what to do about it. So here's the problem, but where is the solution? There's no agreement. Here's a list of some of the ideas that people promote. Oh, maybe we solve the climate crisis 
All we need is more renewables, wind and solar and hydro and geothermal. And other people say, no, we need nuclear. And others say, no, we need fusion. We need a big breakthrough in fusion. Others say, we just have to get rid of the coal. You can see the list here. I don't need to read it all, but there's an enormous array of different ideas. Maybe people say, we just need to stop eating meat and that'll solve the problem. Or others say, we need to use regulatory processes. We need the government to step in. Others say, no, we just need to trust in the free market. There's no agreement here. So what we are doing in our research group and with Climate Interactive is we have developed these interactive simulation models that allow everyone to try out their ideas for what actions and policies would make a difference. Now, why do we do it with an interactive simulation? Why don't I just optimize the system and give you a lecture about what I think we should do to solve the climate crisis. The reason is it won't work. It won't change anybody's mind. Research shows that showing people research does not work. I'm sure, so I don't know how education works here, but I'm sure many of the students in other universities or other places have heard very boring lectures about climate change and it doesn't change anybody's mind, it doesn't change anybody's behavior. So what we do in our work in system dynamics, going all the way back to when you were at MIT and before, is we develop interactive management flight simulators, just like an aircraft simulator, but about how a company works or how an economy works or a society, or in this case, how all of those fit together in the climate challenge. So, I am never going to tell you today, or in any of the meetings I'm having here this week in Tokyo with government uh, ministers, with senior business leaders, I am never going to tell them what I think we ought to do to solve the climate problem, because it won't work. You're going to tell me what to try. So how does that work? Well. This is what the En-ROADS model looks like. Uh, and uh, just a couple of points about this before we get started. First of all, it's a serious model. So it may look easy, it may look fun. I hope it is a little bit fun for you. Also a little bit scary. The climate crisis is very serious. But underneath the hood is a large, complex, dynamic model of the economy, the energy system, the climate, and how they all interact. And that model has been carefully based in the best peer-reviewed science and evidence. And we have ways to deal with the uncertainty there. So it's a serious dynamical model that's had many, many person years of effort going into trying to do our best to ensure that it's representing the best available science. But it's fully interactive and it instantly will show you the likely consequences of your suggestions for how to address the climate crisis. It's also free, so after this session, or even now, if you want to, which is fine, you can go online and you can use it to try your own ideas. And it's fully documented. So unlike many climate models or economic models, every equation is out there, you can go online and read hundreds of pages of technical documentation and you can see exactly how we do everything in the model and then you can critique it and tell us how it can be made better. And then the last thing that I think is really important here is this afternoon you're going to see and get to use the same model that we use with very senior government and business leaders and leaders in civil society around the world. So. On the right-hand side, you see the last time that I briefed uh, former Secretary of State and current U.S. Climate Envoy uh, John Kerry on the model. He's been um, a, a supporter of our work since 2008 and introduced the model to the White House when he was Secretary of State and many people in uh, the Obama administration and in the Biden administration use it. Um, we regularly brief senior leaders. I've personally briefed, I think, 36 United States senators, about 100 members of our House of Representatives, several members of President Biden's cabinet, uh, many state governors and other elected officials. Uh, 
and senior business leaders, many thousands, not just me, but members of our team uh, around the world, and their counterparts in every, every uh, major country, in China, in India, in the UK, in the EU, et cetera. You're gonna have the same simulation today. You're not using a student version. So, how does it work? Well, uh, it, actually before we do that, um, it's also widely used by the public and by students like yourselves or even students in high school and middle school. Uh, and here you can see that um, over 330,000 people that we know of have participated in workshops like this or other workshops in 163 countries around the world, basically everywhere in, in the world. Um, and you all can learn how to do this yourselves. If you go to our project website, you'll be able to access free training materials and videos and programs that we run so that every one of you, faculty and students, can learn how to use this model in your own classes or with your own colleagues and, and uh, community. So please consider doing that. So how does it work? Well, this is what it looks like, but let's get out of PowerPoint and let's look at the model. So it runs in ordinary web browsers. <clears throat> this is what you see here. And the first thing is it's available in 20 languages, including Japanese. Now, I don't speak Japanese and I don't read it, unfortunately. Uh, but if it's okay with you, I can go either way today. Would you rather have the English version today or the Japanese version? English, please. English, please? Okay. Well, let's do that. Um, but it's important that it's available in all these different languages for you, and you can see the wide variety of them here. So, let me explain what you're seeing here, and then we'll have you all work together to come up with a scenario that can make for a much safer climate. So the graph on the left shows total global primary energy consumption. So that's all the energy that is used by everybody globally to run our economy, our society, and run our lives. And it's shown there by source. So the total global amount is the top, but the bars show you how that energy is generated. The bottom line, the brown, is coal. Red is petroleum. Blue is fossil gas, so-called natural gas. Then here we have the renewables. So in the model, we represent wind and solar and geothermal and hydro separately because they all have different costs and supply curves and rates of technological progress. So they have to be modeled separately, but they all produce essentially zero carbon energy, and we add them up in the green wedge of renewable energy. And then on top of that, you've got bioenergy. And in the model, we have three ways to produce bioenergy. We have bioenergy from wood, from crops and crop residues, and from wastes. And then on top of that, the thin blue line is nuclear power. So, where does this information come from? What are the assumptions that are generating it? Well, total energy demand is determined by, for example, population. So you can look here and get a quick overview. So first of all, the more people there are, the more energy they need. And we are using the United Nations most recent population projections here. And you can take a close look at that right here. So this is the total population. In the UN, we have 8.1 billion people today. And the United Nations is projecting 10.4 billion by 2100. But it's very different by country and region. So as you see down here, the United States, the European Union, all the other developed economies of the world, including Japan in this group here, their populations are relatively small and they're not growing significantly and in many countries they're falling. Then here's China whose population has already peaked and is slowly, slowly declining. India is projected to peak in the next decade or so. And then this blue line is the population of all the developing countries other than India, China. And uh, that is where 
all the de demographers expect the most of the remaining population growth to take place. Now, these numbers are uncertain, and so the way the model works is if you think that population is going to be lower or higher, or you just want to see how influential this is, you can simply grab this slider, and as you change it, the model instantly simulates. You can see the population is moving on the left, and that changes how much global warming there's going to be by the year 2100. I'm going to stick with the base case here, but that illustrates how quickly the model simulates, milliseconds, so instantly. So here's population, then there's assumptions about the economy. So if we go down here, what you're seeing here is the baseline assumptions for GDP per capita, real GDP per capita for every region in the world, and all projected to grow. And again, you can change these assumptions if you like. And then what about technology? So in the middle here, we see the energy intensity of the global economy. How much energy do you need to produce a dollar or a yen of real economic well, first, output? May I have a question? Of course, well, please. Well, first GDP projection, because you said that there's a, about the population that's United Nations, but what about GDP? Well, so, first the base, baseline. So there are many such scenarios, and we've calibrated and, and represented many of them. This particular one is um, SSP2, so Shared Socioeconomic Pathway 2, used by the uh, IPCC for economic modeling. Uh, you can go online and read all the details of what that actually means. But if you look, actually, it's a great question. So again, United Nations, yeah, as you said, APCC. Yeah, this is, let's say, United yeah. Nations. And, yeah. uh, you know, if you look at these projections, it reveals something that's quite important and may not be very desirable. But what it shows is every region of the world becomes more affluent but the historic inequality between the developed countries and the lesser developed emerging economies does not go away by the year 2100. Now you can change this, but that's a standard assumption. I'm not gonna defend it as being correct or a good prediction. It's just a standard assumption that lots of climate modelers and other modelers make. And you're welcome to use the model and try alternatives as, as you like. So, um, Coming back to the energy intensity of the GDP, uh, it's been declining, meaning it, we can produce more goods and services with the same amount of energy. Why? Technological progress and a gradual shift from a more industrial economy historically to a more service and then information-based economy that needs less energy. We're pro projecting that that trend will continue and it's important for you to know how we treat climate policy in the baseline scenario. So if a country has implemented a climate policy, meaning there's a law, there's a regulation, there's a company that's taken action, something is happening on the ground, we include it. So as an example, the United States passed the Inflation Reduction Act a year and a half ago. Those are, that's now law and people are starting to change their behavior and emissions are starting to respond. But when a country or a company says, we pledge to be net zero emissions by 2050, that's just a promise. That's a pledge. There's nothing real happening until they do something on the ground. In the climate negotiations, the uh, the COPs, the Conference of the Parties, the annual climate summit, the one we just had in Dubai, or the Paris Agreement uh, in 2015, and I was there with our team. I've been to many of them. We have members of our team at all of them using our model to help the negotiators uh, and to, uh, to speak truth to power, to talk to the media and critique the proposals. So if a company or a country says, we pledge to be net zero by 2050, until they do something, it's not in the model because it's just what we call hot air. So. But how do you assess this? How do we assess? Yes, like whether it's just a declaration. Do you do it in a dynamic way, like 24 hours, somebody checks it, or you have, I don't know, annual meetings or something? How do you make it work? Whether it's just a declaration, do you check the statistics? Because, you know, like, 
So take a look at the Chinese statistics, for instance. Yeah. Well, so you can't wonderful. get it from statistics. You have to actually look at uh, are there laws, regulations, or actions that countries and companies are actually taking. Uh, you can't get it from looking at emissions alone. You have to look at what they say, what they do, are there laws, are there policies in place. Uh, and then in answer to your question of how fast can we do it, you know, coming up to each annual climate summit, there's always a flurry of public declarations just leading up to them. And we're able to run our model very quickly and try to assess what the impact of the different pledges and promises might be if they were implemented. So we can try to do it very quickly. You, this is an important point because uh, the negotiations happen quickly, especially during the annual climate summits, last year in Dubai, next year in Azerbaijan. Um, you can't operate at the speed of academia and say, well, we'll run a research study and in a year we'll have a paper. That's not going to work. So what else is going on? There's how much carbon you need per unit of energy. And that is also projected to decline even with current policies and without counting these hot air pledges. So if you take population and you multiply it by GDP per capita, that gives you the total gross world product, the GDP of all the countries of the world added up. If you multiply that by the energy intensity of the economy, that gives you total energy demand, which is what I showed you on that first graph. And if you multiply that by the carbon intensity of the energy system, that gives you the carbon dioxide emissions, the greenhouse emissions from the energy system. And that's the final graph on the right here showing that in our baseline, given these assumptions, those emissions are projected to grow. Now much less than the economy because of the improving technology here, but still projected to grow. So those are our baseline assumptions and you can change them but I'm gonna propose we stick with that for right now. So here you've got the energy mix. Total energy demand is growing, and you can see the green wedge of renewables is growing very strongly going forward, but not fast enough to drive out the fossil fuels. So coal grows a little bit, oil shrinks a little bit, natural gas grows a little bit, total fossil energy is growing a little bit more and then almost staying constant. And that means greenhouse gas emissions that you see here grow and then reach high levels and stay there. So this graph is the total emissions globally of all the different greenhouse gases. The green represents carbon dioxide emissions from deforestation and land degradation. Then that's about 15% of the total global emissions. Then the big gray band here, that is all the carbon dioxide that we spew into the atmosphere every year by burning the coal, oil, and gas, the fossil fuels over here. And that is by far the largest contributor to climate change, burning fossil fuels. And then there are gases that are beyond CO2 that are also significant climate warming agents. Fluorinated gases. So that's this band right here. These are the fluorinated gases, CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons. These are the same compounds that destroy the ozone hole uh, or that create the ozone hole. Chlorofluorocarbons, CFCs, PFCs, HFCs, sulfur hexafluoride. The model represents all of them separately and each has their own emissions flow, emissions budget, atmospheric stock, lifetime, and contribution to global warming, what's called radiative forcing. Maybe yes, sir, another question. Uh, uh, wait, wait for the microphone. Why the bioenergy is a separate category? You have renewables. Why the bioenergy is separate? And why don't you distinguish lignite and the hard coal, for instance, but just one category as a coal? Same with renewables. Is it possible to divide them if you distinguish bioenergy, for instance? Yeah. So, Bioenergy is different than wind and solar because you need a, an organic, biologically alive feedstock, which means carbon is converted by photosynthesis into plants, trees, crops, whatever. And then when you use those for energy, that carbon goes back into the atmosphere and could, can contribute to warming. 
And maybe it'll grow back, but that is not certain and it takes time. And that's why you have to treat bioenergy separately from other kinds of renewables like wind and solar. And we have three ways to make bioenergy that are popular in the real world and therefore separate in the model. Wood, crops and crop residues, and then wastes. So according to this definition, bioenergy is not renewable? Well, the European Union calls it renewable and calls it zero carbon, but that's an example of politicians declaring whatever they like, no matter what the laws of physics say. So it's not true. It's not obvious that bioenergy is intrinsically renewable. And one of the things, if you hold on a minute, when we sure. get to the policies, you have the option to incentivize and accelerate bioenergy or the other way, and we'll see if it matters to what happens to the climate. So, okay, so non-CO2 gases. We have the fluorinated gases here, very long-lived, very powerful warming agents. This light blue is methane. Methane is not only used in energy, so-called natural gas, but when it escapes into the atmosphere, it is a very powerful greenhouse gas, more powerful molecule for molecule than carbon dioxide. And it's, a, it's the biggest non-CO2 gas. It's the second biggest greenhouse gas. And then that top purple line is nitrous oxide, N2O, an even more powerful greenhouse gas with an even longer lifetime in the atmosphere. So once you emit it, it stays in the atmosphere for uh, hundreds of years and warms the climate every day that it's there. So emissions growing, what's the consequence? Well, the consequence is global warming is going to continue unless we can lower those emissions. So this is global average surface temperature, so global average temperatures in degrees above pre-industrial levels. The first thing you need to know, and maybe you already do, is that because of all the greenhouse emissions since the Industrial Revolution, we've already warmed the planet more than one degree. In fact, 2023 was the warmest, hottest year in human history by far we're already close to 1.4 degrees above, right now above pre-industrial levels. In the baseline scenario that we're looking at here with continued emissions of fossil fuels, we breached the one and a half degree threshold, which was the aspirational level in Paris by 2030 or so, just a few years from now. And then warming continues and we breached the two degree threshold, which is the absolute upper limit of what scientists believe and what every nation has agreed not to exceed in the Paris Agreement. Scientists think above two degrees we're in big trouble. We breached that level by about mid-century when all the students here, I'm hoping to still be here in 2050. I'll be 95. Still teaching at MIT. You all are still going to be very much alive and in the middle of your lives and careers, possibly with your own families. This is a big deal for you. And then it just keeps going. And by 2100, we're at 3.3 degrees above pre-industrial. And if it, we have any Americans here, that's six degrees Fahrenheit. OK. So what would the impact of that be? This would be nothing short of catastrophic for humans. And I want to just say, I know that I'm putting my reputation as a scientist on the line when I use a strong word like catastrophic. But honestly, there's no other way to describe it that's correct. What the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, says is, and I'm quoting here, we get up towards the high twos, three, more than three. What they say is we're going to have severe and irreversible consequences with limited ability to adapt. Let me say that again. Severe and irreversible consequences with limited ability to adapt. So what does that really mean? 
Well, imagine you went to your doctor because you weren't feeling well, and your doctor did a bunch of tests and said, you know, I'm very sorry, but you have a condition that's going to lead to severe and irreversible consequences, and there's almost nothing we can do for you. Needless to say, that would be a very difficult diagnosis for you. But that is the diagnosis for our planet, unless we can get those emissions to fall. So, what are some of the consequences of that kind of warming? Well, in our model, we track a variety of the impacts of climate change. This is only some of them, because some of them, the science is not yet able to quantify them to a level of rigor that we would like. But, for example, let's take a look at the acidification of the oceans. So, carbon dioxide increases in the atmosphere as we burn fossil fuels, and then that increases the flow of carbon dioxide into the ocean, which moderates warming, but acidifies the ocean. The CO2 dissociates and becomes carbonic acid. It lowers the pH of the ocean, and that threatens the ability of any creature that needs to build a shell out of calcium carbonate, and that threatens the base of all the food webs in the ocean. So maybe no more sushi and sashimi. But more seriously, hundreds of millions of people around the world depend on the ocean for their livelihood and their protein, and that is at risk. All the corals are at risk. Uh, many of them are already bleached and dead or dying now. That's projected to continue to get worse because emissions continue and the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere continues to grow, as you see here. What else might be happening? Well. Burning fossil fuels produces a lot of air pollution. And this shows the emissions of PM 2.5, the small, very small soot particles, 2.5 microns or below, that can get deep into your lungs, cause disease. The World Health Organization tells us that between seven and eight million people die prematurely every year from PM 2.5 and other air pollution that's created mostly by burning fossil fuels. Seven to eight million people. To put that in perspective for you, four years now since COVID began, the cumulative official death toll from the COVID pandemic is about seven million people. After four years, this is a COVID's worth of death every year and harming labor productivity because it causes lung disease, harming the performance of kids in school, causing many other damages, increasing healthcare costs. So that is another major impact of fossil fuels. Uh, crop yields. Uh, so I showed you that the United, whoops, the United Nations is projecting 10.4 billion people by 2100. How are those people going to be fed? We're going to need to increase crop yields, but global warming lowers crop yields compared to what they would otherwise be by large amounts. So this is a projection from IPCC data on how much the crop yield for the big four grains, rice, uh, uh, corn, wheat, rice, and soy, are projected to drop in a world of 3.3 by 2100. Double-digit declines for crop yields relative to what they would be for uh, corn and wheat, almost 10% for rice and soy. How are we going to feed everybody in a world like that? Uh, what else is going on? I won't show you all of them, but how about deaths from exposure to extreme heat? So from, for different parts of the world, deaths are going to go up at different rates. The place in the world where people are going to be dying from exposure to extreme heat the most is Southeast Asia. Why? Because that's where wet bulb temperatures are highest already today. That means the highest heat and humidity. And more people there are in developing countries. Think, think Vietnam, Cambodia, Thailand, Bangladesh, India, etc. cetera. Uh, and in those countries, more people are working in agriculture and construction, so they're working outside and are exposed to the heat. And air conditioning is much less available than it is, say, in Japan or in the United States. 
Uh, but even in the rich countries, even in the developed economies, uh, Northern Europe, North America, Australia, and here in Japan, where people are privileged and have access to air conditioning, deaths from extreme heat are still projected to rise. And this will disproportionately hurt the lowest income, most disadvantaged people in our society. Yes, sir. So, Can you wait for the microphone? Yeah, here's, here's another one. This is an excellent question. Go ahead. Yeah, I was, I was wondering why Africa and, and uh, West Asia or Middle East are missing. Um, is that because they get used to the no, no, no. temperature? It, it's extremely important. Right now, the data aren't good enough for us to include. We know this is a terrible omission. There's hundreds of millions of people living in these regions and deserve to be captured. We can't put that into the model until there's enough scientifically grounded evidence for it. And we're hoping to, to correct that problem as soon as we can. So thank you for pointing that out. OK, so um, this is the part of the session where you're supposed to be feeling depressed and sad. Is it working? Yes. Good, so I'm not done yet. Um, Cecilia may know this, but at MIT, our students have given me a nickname. And they call me Dr. Doom. And uh, this is why, right? Now, I personally don't think I'm a pessimistic, depressed person. It's up to you to decide. You are, you're going to make that judgment, not me. But um, why do they call me that? It's because of what you see here. The students I deal with at MIT at the Sloan School of Management are incredibly smart, capable, experienced people, but they're studying business and they come out of the business world, most of them. And so very few of them have any training in ecology or climate science or any of these issues. And it comes as a rather big shock what's really going on in the world and where we're headed. So if you're feeling like, I'm getting a little scared here, that's good, because this is happening now. Climate is, climate is changing, and even now, at about 1.3, 1.4 degrees, people are dying at higher rates, more conflict, more climate refugees, more economic disruption. It's already harming everybody now, and it's going to get a lot worse. So let me show you one more uh, before we have you solve the problem, and that's sea level rise. So this is from IPCC uh, models in their most recent uh, assessment. And it suggests 70 centimeters of sea level rise by the year 2100, accelerating upward. And it would continue for hundreds of years and become many, many meters going forward. But since the last IPCC report came out, the science about how quickly Antarctica and Greenland are melting and increasing sea level has moved very quickly and in the direction of even more sea level rise. So one of the things you can do in our model is you can change the assumptions. Oops. So let's change some assumptions. You can change an enormous array of assumptions about the climate, about agriculture, technologies, economics, et cetera. Right now, let's look at sea level rise. So. Um, these numbers are definitely too low, given the most recent science. And something more realistic might be on the order of about this. Faster melting of Antarctica and Greenland as warming proceeds. And that would give you approximately one meter of sea level rise by 2100. So what would that mean around the world? Well, one of the things we can do here is we have partnered with another nonprofit, Climate Central. And we, the model is now sending them the amount of sea level rise by 2100. And they send back what it looks like in any coastal region of the planet. So what, let me make this a little bigger. And what you're seeing here is the Gulf Coast of the United States. So here's New Orleans. And then going over here, here is Houston. And all of that dark blue would be inundated underwater by 2100 with one meter of sea level rise. Now, I got to tell you, that would be bad enough, but it's over-optimistic. It 
underestimates the impact of sea level rise. Why? First of all, that's average. It doesn't even count for high tides, and it doesn't count for what happens when there are storms. So the Gulf of Mexico is a high hurricane zone. Um, Hurricane Katrina that hit New Orleans, five meter storm surge. Last year, Hurricane Ian hit the west coast of Florida, four meter storm surge. And this is true in this part of the world too. Typhoons in uh, East Asia, uh, Typhoon Haiyan some years ago, direct hit on the Philippines, five meter storm surge. Many others since then, three, four, five meters of storm surge. So what we can do here is we can ask, well, what would happen if there was a, I'll say, four meter storm surge on top of this one meter, what would happen to the Gulf Coast of the United States? And this is a catastrophic situation because what is happening in this region of the United States? First of all, a huge fraction of the oil and gas industry's infrastructure is there. Wells, pipelines, refineries, petrochemical plants, there's also military bases that are vital to our national security, internet backbone, interstate highways, rail lines, other critical infrastructure of the United States would all be inundated as this happens. And this is still over optimistic because we don't yet have models that are granular enough to show us the impact of the extreme rainfall that comes with a typhoon or a hurricane. Uh, when Hurricane Harvey hit Houston, much of Houston was flooded. It doesn't look flooded in the map. The reason the real storm caused so much flooding in Houston was on top of the storm surge, you had 60 inches, so 1.7 meters, maybe a little more, of rain in 48 hours. And that's not yet in the model. So, this is a very such serious situation. Now, you can look anywhere you want. I'm going to invite you on your own to look at the places in Japan that you think are most interesting. But um, let me show you something else. Let's look at Shanghai. Now, you get typhoons in the East China Sea. So what happens if a four-meter storm surge typhoon hits Shanghai on top of one meter of sea level rise? So here's the old city. Here's the new city. Here's Lake Taihu. This is a catastrophe. You can look at any other place you want. I'm going to just show you one more, um, and then we're going to move on. Let's look at the Indus River Delta on the border of India and Pakistan. Now, they do get storms here, probably not as big. Uh, so let's take a look. So what do we see here? Well, first of all, this will cause the massive displacement when a storm like that hits on top of the sea level rise, it's going to cause gradual and then acute displacement of people who will become climate refugees. So what does that mean in this particular, this is not a region that's central to the global modern high-tech economy, but it straddles the border between these two great nations, India and Pakistan, nations that are in tension militarily, who still dispute parts of this border. And this could create potential conflict between these two great nations, both of whom have nuclear weapons. So sometimes when I do this, people say, well, I live in Hokkaido and very high, or I live in Denver, it's very high, I don't care about sea level rise. Doesn't matter where you live, this is going to affect you. One last thing, and that is, what do all of these impacts and all the other impacts of climate change, what do they do to the economy? Well, as the planet warms up and all of these harms and threats begin to get worse and worse and worse, economic growth is going to suffer. So what happens to the economy? Well, this is an uncertain question, but the best available peer-reviewed studies suggest it's going to reduce economic growth, let's see by how much. So this is GDP per capita, real GDP per capita going forward, and the dashed line is what the GDP per capita global average would be 
if climate had no further impact on the economy, something we know is not true. And then the line below, right here, shows one well-regarded study's estimate of what the actual damage would be. Now, people sometimes tell me, oh, well, okay, it slows down economic growth, but the economy is still growing. What's the problem? Well, the problem is, this means hundreds of millions of people, perhaps billions, will not be rising out of poverty and joining the global middle class quickly enough to prevent suffering, health problems, migration, and conflict. And honestly, I think this is over-optimistic. I think it's quite likely that economic growth could be much worse. But let's take what we have here. Look at the magnitude of the economic losses here. And then look at this. That little drop right there, that is the economic damage caused by the COVID pandemic. Now you all lived through it. A number of my close friends and colleagues died. And perhaps some of you have family or friends who succumbed to the disease. And we all experienced the economic hardship that came with COVID. And it's not something you want to do again. But take a look at how big the COVID impact, impact was and compare that to what's coming. What's coming at us from climate change makes this COVID impact on the economy look like a little blip. So this is your challenge. Actually, let me ask a question. Who's feeling just a little bit anxious right now, or maybe a little more anxious. I see some hands if you feel, yeah, including as quickly. So yeah, I think there's good reason to be concerned, if not anxious, worried. Now you shouldn't despair because this is not inevitable. How are we gonna solve this problem? That's what you're gonna tell me. So let me bring back energy and emissions. And now down here are all the kinds of actions and policies that might be used to solve this climate problem. So take a look over at the left. Here we've got, remember, coal, oil, and gas remaining very, very important in the energy mix going forward. Well, maybe you'd like to reduce the use of coal. Well, how can you do that? Here you could tax or regulate or phase down, phase out the coal. You can also do that for oil, for gas. Here is bioenergy. You could incentivize more bioenergy or disincentivize it and see if that will make a difference to the climate. Here you could accelerate the deployment of renewable energy with in tax breaks or uh, incentives that we know how to do. Here you can do the same for nuclear. New zero carbon electricity lets us simulate the impact of a radical technological breakthrough like fusion or practical green hydrogen uh, or ammonia-based fuels or whatever it might be. Something that doesn't exist today, but maybe we are smart enough to create it. Here you can put a price on carbon emissions. And then in the middle, you can work on the end use of energy, accelerate improvements in efficiency how we use energy for transportation, for buildings, for industrial processes, and you can electrify end uses, electrify transport, electrify uh, our buildings and our industrial processes. We talked about population economic growth. Over here, you could reduce deforestation, you could plant trees, afforestation, you could work on the methane, the fluorinated gases, and the nitrous oxide over here, and here we have what's called technological carbon dioxide removal. These are speculative, mostly speculative technologies like direct air capture, enhanced mineralization, natural solutions like uh, 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 no-till, low-till agriculture, so more nature-based solutions to sequester carbon, and uh, biochar and bioenergy for carbon capture with carbon capture and sequestration. So here, whoops, put this back. Here is your baseline, and now I turn it over to you.
So here's what I want you to do. I want you to talk to the person next to you for just a couple of minutes and come up with a, a couple of ideas of what you think high leverage actions would be. What could we do from this set of levers that you think would have a high impact on warming? If you're already using the model, terrific. If you're not, just what do you think has happened? So partner up. You have to talk now. This is not for me. This is for you. Talk to the person next to you. Just a few minutes. Come up with your ideas. May I have a question? Yeah, of course. What about the electrification of transport? Well, uh, try it out. Yeah, yeah, but uh, is the mix I have in energy supply the basis for the electrification of transport? Let's say that in my country or in the world I have like 100 coal. So if I intensify electrification, it means that this electrification of transport is fueled, powered by the black energy. That's the thing. That's a great question, and what I would urge you to do is try it out, and let's see what happens. So you can recommend electrifying transport or anything else that you'd like to try. So let's go. I need to hear some talking now. You can't do this by telepathy. You have to talk to the person next to you. You need to partner up with somebody, so why don't you join right here, you know, sit next to each other. This is not something where you can just sit back. You've got to get busy with a partner. So you need to partner up. 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 Let's go. What do you think is high leverage and doable in the real world? Okay, we have a question, go ahead. Now, if we talk about net zero carbons or renewable energies, I don't think they are net zero carbons. Renewable energies always, and electrifications always produce so, the CO2. And we look here at the downstream, not the upstream. Right? So you're asking about the life cycle emissions associated with say wind or solar or other, technologies. And, and with the creations of the batteries that. and... Uh, yeah. So we do try to account for that. Uh, so for example, if you decide that you want to build more nuclear plants, it uses a lot of fossil and all the concrete and steel to build a nuclear plant. We account for that. We do make the perhaps optimistic assumption that once your nuclear plant is operating, it's producing zero carbon electricity, even though there are still some residual emissions. Yeah. There are studies that they shows that the actually the emissions coming from producing the batteries, the lithium batteries, actually in the mining and in the productions, they actually produce a lot of uh, CO2s. So this is something. And the other thing is that a lot of governments, they're actually moving between resilience and green practices. And resilience means we need hybrid approach. Well, so you can, you can recommend a hybrid approach here if you like and see what happens. How we doing? You want another minute? We got to get you going and see what happens. Uh, I'm going to call on students first. Is that okay? Okay. So, who's got an idea? And I'd love to hear from the students first. So, we have a bunch of students right here. Give me an idea. What do you think would make a big difference? How about the two of you over there? What do you like? Uh, Go ahead. I think carbon price is carbon price. one of the most effective ways to reduce carbon emissions. Because I think if we have uh, the government introduce carbon price system, maybe the, all the businesses will change their policies and maybe they try to make profits as usual so they want to reduce uh, carbon emissions so Great. I mean the carbon price have uh, effects to all of the industries. Great so the recommendation here is let's try pricing carbon emissions. We don't price them in most places now that creates a huge 
negative externality. Let's close that loophole that lets anybody pollute and change the climate without paying for the damage. So here's the question. If we, if, so first of all, there's two ways, two fundamental popular ways to do this. You could tax carbon or you could have a cap and trade program. Both exist in different countries around the world. Then the most important question is how much of a price? So right now, our estimate is that the average global price of carbon is extremely low, only about $5 per ton of carbon dioxide. The reason it's so low is many countries don't have a carbon price at all, and those that do, the average is offset by the countries that are heavily subsidizing their fossil fuels. So it's practically zero. And then the question is, how big of a carbon price would you like to try that you think is potentially politically acceptable if humanity were acting with their best interests at heart. If you want to be a cynic, you would say it stays at zero, right? But that's not going to help us. So um, many people don't know how to think about the price of carbon. Does anybody want to suggest a carbon price? What kind of a level of how many dollars per ton of CO2 you Let's think? Let's ask U.S. farmers. Let's ask the group here. So, any ideas? I yes, sir. Cost, I $50. $50 per, per ton. ton. Okay. Reasonable, reasonable value. So, something that might be politically achievable and big enough to perhaps make a big difference. So, let's try $50. Now, we're at 3.32 degrees of warming now by 2100. So let's see what the impact might be. Now before I do it, I'm going to ask you to estimate what you think the impact might be. If you're using the model, you might have a good idea. If you're not, just give it your best judgment. So how many, you, and you have to vote, okay? You have to have an opinion. So how many of you think it might be um, still three degrees or more? at $50. Raise your hand if you think more than three or more. So about uh, six or eight people. Uh, say, let's say two and a half to three. Okay, remember you're gonna have to vote. So less than two and a half. Uh, people are not all voting. It's really important to do this because you wanna test your mental model against what the simulation says. Doesn't make the simulation right but that's how you're going to begin to unpack why it does what it does and whether you think it's credible. All right, so we have a mix of opinions. People are all over the map. Very little impact to very large impact. Let's see what happens. $50 a ton, 3.32 now, wow, 2.9. This is a huge impact. $50 a ton is not a big increase in, say, the price of gasoline. In dollars per liter, what is the price of gasoline in Tokyo? I can't do it in yen in my head, but in dollars per liter? Buck 40, a buck 30. 30. A dollar 30 per liter. A dollar 30 per liter, so about almost $5 a gallon. Um, $50 a ton of CO2 would raise, would, would be a uh, price on carbon that would raise, that would have an impact of about 48 cents per gallon of gasoline, so 12 cents a liter. That's not much, not much, okay? And it made a huge difference to the climate from 3.3 to 2.9, that's really high impact. This is a high leverage policy. So why does it work so well, even at $50? Because it touches everybody everywhere. This is exactly what you said and you're absolutely right. It creates a powerful incentive for everybody everywhere to be more efficient and use less energy because most of the energy is still coming from fossil. And then it creates a powerful incentive to change the energy mix away from fossil and towards the renewables. And if you look at that graph on the left, you'll see that compared to where we were, which is here, fossils go down and the green wedge of renewables gets much larger. Total energy demand also goes down. That's the result of the efficiency. This is a very high leverage policy. Now there's a big political problem. 
everybody understands that if you do this and you don't do anything else, it would be regressive, meaning it would hurt low-income individuals the most. There's a way to solve that problem. Any ideas? How do we solve the problem that putting a price on carbon would hurt low-income people, people in developing countries, and retirees living on fixed incomes would hurt them more than affluent people like us? How do we solve that problem? Yes, sir, go ahead. Um, to have a support co-bonds kind of uh, for energies for those uh, segments of people? Uh, so you, you would like Some to countries, they do that, they give uh, Subsidize them so that they wouldn't have to pay the carbon price? The, exactly, or reduced price compared so to the rest. That's what many countries do now. They subsidize fuel and food, but the problem with that is it eliminates the incentive for efficiency. So there's a, an alternative, a, a friendly amendment to your proposal, and that is called price and dividend. So you take all the revenue from the carbon price and you give it back to the people as a carbon dividend. And in that case, you get compensated if you're poor, you get compensated, but you still have to pay the price of energy with the carbon price in it. So you still have the incentive to be efficient, to drive less, to maybe ride a bicycle or get a more efficient vehicle or move closer to your job or whatever it would be, but you don't suffer economically. This is a proposal that's actually being done in Canada right now today and has been proposed even in the United States by very conservative Republicans, including uh, uh, one popular proposal for, for the dividend is called the Baker-Schultz proposal named after two impeccably conservative Republican former secretaries of state, Jim Baker and the late George Schultz. I had a chance to brief George Schultz with an early version of this model, and uh, we had a very, very good time. He was a very smart guy and uh, had a PhD from MIT in economics too. So that was a lot of fun. So cap and dividend or price and dividend is a way to solve the equity problem and help all the low income developing economy people uh, and still have all the benefits of the carbon price. Now $50 is low. We can leave it there now. Just for fun, right now in the European trading system, carbon prices are trading at close to $100 a ton. So uh, let me try that and then I'll take your comment. So let's see what happens. We went from 3.3 to 2.9. If we try $100 a ton, that's 89 cents a gallon in the US, another two-tenths of a degree of benefit. And I'm phasing it in gradually over 10 years. You can change all of those assumptions when you play with the model yourself. Uh, 2.7. But I'm going to put it back to 50, and we're at 2.9. Go ahead, comment. We're still speculating. So these policies, when it's implemented by governments, they are trying, and then they see what the impact is. But there is a little solution that I encourage sometimes my students to work on is to build hybrid models, is to combine the discrete and um, multi-agent simulations with the system dynamics sure. and build complexity profiles to try to test different assumptions before I, actually implementing the systems. I, I love that idea, and we try to do that too. This is not the answer machine. This is one model, and there's a lot of improvements and suggestions that could be implemented, and a very good way to approach this is try to get uh, a way to model it with using a different modeling architecture or bring in different perspectives, and then see if the conclusions are robust. That would give you more confidence, and if they're not, then you have to be more careful. So I totally agree with that perspective. At the same time, you know, we do a lot of work in Washington and with other policymakers, government people. They don't wait for academics like us to take two years and come up with a study. They need to know the answer right away. So there's a delicate balance that needs to be struck there between being 
helpful in the policy process without compromising the scientific rigor of the work. <laughs> Go ahead, David. Yeah. Any simulation, even one like this, it's nice to be able to calibrate and see whoever predicts things. Uh, about, probably about the only way, I don't, don't know whether we have enough data, is go back five years, look at the world of five, five years ago, and then the changes, and do you get the result of today? Great That's question. Great question. So we've actually uh, worked hard to calibrate the model against historical data. I'm just going to show you a couple of examples really quickly. We actually start in 1990 for the economic part of the model, 1750 for the climate part of the model. And what you're seeing here as an example, the thin line is the data for the marginal cost of solar photovoltaics, and the thick line is the model. And as you all know, solar has become dramatically cheaper, significantly less than a dollar per peak watt. Now it's 30 or 40 cents per, per peak watt, uh, actually even lower here. Uh, and the model tracks that very nicely. So that's just one example. I'll show you one more, and that is how well does the model track global warming? So from 1990 to 2022, uh, here's the data, global average surface temperature, and the black line is the model. The model is not intended to capture the year-to-year -year fluctuations, which is El Nino, La Nina, other short-term events, uh, but it gets the trend essentially right down the middle. Um, and uh, we've calibrated the model against many, many, many dozens of other variables, economic, energy, climate, uh, and you can access them all yourself online by clicking here. So fantastic comment and totally right, and we've spent a lot of effort to make sure that the model is consistent with the historical behavior of the system. So carbon price. Congratulations, this is a very high leverage policy. We're down to 2.9, big, big improvement, but that's still nowhere close to two degrees. What else would be helpful? Do you have a suggestion back here? We put the uh, EV station. Uh, electric vehicles, is that okay? So you want to electrify transportation? Great, let's check it out. So one of the things you'll notice is uh, and this goes to the question we had earlier, coal is greatly reduced by the carbon price. Why? Because it's the most carbon intensive fuel. Well, we still have a lot of gasoline, that's in the petroleum wedge here. Let's electrify transportation. We're at 2.9. In the base case, there's a lot of electrification. The carbon price accelerates that a little bit, but because it makes gasoline more expensive. But now, let's promote electric vehicles. Now, we're only going to electrify land-based transportation for right now. There's people working on electric aircraft, but it's, you know, I'm not going to be flying from Tokyo to Boston on an electric plane anytime soon. So uh, let's, let's electrify it. And here we go. Whoops. As we increase the subsidy for electrification to 25% of the cost of the car, which is about what the subsidy is in the United States right now, uh, there's a dramatic increase in the pace of electric vehicle sales, cars, trucks, long distance trucking, rail, and it took another tenth of a degree off. So that helped a lot. Now, it depends a lot. So here's the base case without a carbon price, lots of coal. If I electrify under that scenario, it barely makes any difference at all. Why? Exactly what this gentleman said earlier. If you switch from gasoline powered cars to electric cars, but you're getting most of your electricity from coal, which is the case in China and India today, then you simply substitute tailpipe emissions, which are going down with coal plant emissions, which would go up. And you can see that happening in the simulation here. If we don't do anything else, more electrification, less gasoline, the red, the red band goes down, but the coal gets bigger. And so you have to simultaneously decarbonize your electric generation system while you're promoting your electric cars. So going back to here, you, your policy has eliminated much of the coal but there's still a fair amount of coal in the world here. 
with the carbon price, and that is mitigating the benefits of electrified transportation. Yes, sir. Uh, Japan has, an, has put a lot of effort into the hydrogen economy, and you know we have hydrogen fuel cell cars, um, lots of filling stations, empty filling stations around yep. you'll drive by. Um, assuming that it's green hydrogen, or that it is white hydrogen, I guess, from the earth, which there's a speculation about, right. where would that be picked up in the model? Right, so great question. So, um, and such. two things about this. The first is we are working on expanding the model to explicitly include hydrogen made from multiple sources, white, green, and blue, or brown. Right. That's going to be released in the future, but it isn't here right now. Okay. For right now, the way we can simulate that, because we don't have a green hydrogen economy anywhere in the world right now, we're not able to produce green hydrogen at scale. White hydrogen is still basically speculative. So uh, this would be captured with the new zero carbon policy lever here. So when you pull this lever, you're imagining that there's technical breakthroughs, in this case, a green sustainable hydrogen production supply chain and usage system that uh, is somehow developed. Now we can't guarantee that that will ever happen. And if you think about fusion, which is also something you would model this way, nobody can guarantee that it will ever be practical and certainly not when it is. But we can try it and let's see what happens. So, you know, in what year do you think we could have a practical green hydrogen system? By what, you know? Sorry? 2050. 2050. Okay, great. So what I'm going to do here is we'll use the detailed settings. We're going to make the, uh, the breakthrough, let's say the breakthrough happens in 2040. And then there's a uh, commercialization time. And I'm going to make it 10 years. So 2050, you can go big at scale. Um, and then what's the initial cost relative to coal? Well, we start at two here, but maybe we can be really uh, much better than that. Let's make it the same. So this is quite optimistic, perhaps. And you can see the impact right here. This wedge, this is all your green hydrogen. And it's making a big difference to the energy mix. Did it make a big difference to climate? Well, where were we? We were, without it, at 2.84. With it, breakthrough in 2040, we're at 2.77. It made almost no difference. Now, why? If you, ha if you have a high enough cost of carbon, you've already crushed fossil fuels anyway. There's still a places. lot of fossil fuels in the mix. They're on the decline, but they yeah. aren't out okay. yet. Um, is it substituting away from other renewables? Oh, that's I mean, a very interesting comment. Yeah. So take a look at the energy mix. The uh, green hydrogen or fusion power comes in very quickly after the breakthrough and a, only a 10-year average commercialization time comes in very quickly, but what happens to the energy mix? Well, it's definitely squeezing out some of the remaining fossil, but what's happening to the other low carbon, zero carbon technologies? Well, take a look at the green wedge here. The green wedge is really big, and as you develop your green hydrogen or fusion power, fossils get reduced but green renewables were providing most of the power and they are being reduced. And the economic logic for this is very straightforward. You've assumed something gets really cheap and of course the market will like it. And so energy providers, electric utilities, they're gonna go big on hydrogen and they're not gonna build as many utility scale solar plants or offshore wind farms or battery storage facilities, and so the green wedge shrinks. So zero carbon from our hydrogen displaces other zero carbon and very little net effect. And the other big, big uh, contribution to the low impact here is 
2040 for the breakthrough, 2050 for getting to scale. That was your suggestion. In the meantime, between now and then, we're still burning all those fossil fuels. And every day that that carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere, it warms the climate. So you all know the, the concept of the time value of money. You would strictly prefer to have a dollar today than a dollar in 2030 or 2050 because you could invest it today and have more money in those years. That's the time value of money. In the same way, there's a time value of carbon because the half-life of carbon in the atmosphere is on the order of 100 years. So if you put carbon in the atmosphere today, it worsens climate change for hundreds of years. And that means that it's far more valuable to cut emissions today than to, to, to reduce emissions by one ton today than to reduce emissions by that same ton in 2030, 2040, 2050. So because this doesn't kick in until later, it has much lim limited impact. Th these are really important insights that you're suggesting here. But we can leave it in the mix, or if you think it's too speculative and can't be relied upon, we can take it out. This is up to you. Didn't really matter to the climate, so. Yeah, we'll take it out. Yeah. All right, so we'll take it out. So uh, back to 2.8. So we have a long way to go, and you know we're scheduled for uh, until 4 o'clock, but I'm not letting anybody out of the room until we get under 2 degrees. <laughs> so what else do you want to try? <laughs> you think I'm joking. What else do you want to try? Let's hear from some of the other students. How about right here? What did you like? Energy efficiency. Fantastic. Let's see what happens. So um, let's try improving the energy efficiency of transportation. And then we can also look at buildings and industry. So what's happening now? Well, with the carbon price, we're already getting improvements in efficiency. But we could probably accelerate that further. Where are we? We're at 2.84. Let's improve the efficiency of transportation and buildings and industrial processes. And now we're at 2.52. This is a very high leverage action. So that's great. So why does it work? Why does it work? Could you give me a hint? A hint. Do you, would you like to phone a friend? <laughs> uh, I'll give you a hint. Um, if I am going to uh, drive a big American SUV that gets 15 miles to the gallon, so it's super inefficient, and then I switch to a more efficient car, even if it's still burning gasoline, like a Toyota Prius, 50 miles per gallon, then I need less gasoline. And so what happens as you move upstream in the supply chain? Oh, maybe that companies research more about efficiency? First, that's a great point. Companies in the automobile industry, in the energy industries, are going are gonna to see the demand for gasoline is falling. And if we want to stay in business, then we need to find a way to move into renewables where it's growing instead of shrinking. Great point. In addition, let me give you a slightly different example. Suppose that we improve the energy efficiency of a house. So we burn less fossil gas for heating the house. Now, the gas industry doesn't need to produce as much, and all of the transmission and distribution losses in the supply chain are reduced, and we have uh, an amplification of the benefit. So energy efficiency is very, very powerful here. Also, transportation efficiency matters a lot because that's reducing the demand for petroleum. And then buildings and industry efficiency matters a lot because that is a huge chunk of global emissions because we have a lot of buildings, there's a lot of housing, there's a lot of commercial real estate, there's a lot of university space, and a lot of industrial processes that burn natural gas, for example, in cement making. And by reducing uh, the uh, losses, by increasing efficiency, uh, you greatly reduce energy demand, 
and that lowers the total use of fossil fuels. And buildings can be retrofitted. So you can make those changes relatively quickly for the existing building stock. And as long as we're looking at the building sector, you've already electrified transportation. What happens if we electrify buildings as well and industrial processes? Well, we're at 2.52. And if we electrify here, a little bit more everywhere, 2.49. That helps a lot. So now what have we got? Look at the building levers. We have very efficient buildings and we've electrified. What does that mean? It means you're not burning natural gas to heat your house anymore. You have heat pumps. So the heat pumps are very common here in Japan, but not so much yet in the United States. Let me tell you a story. My house outside of Boston is almost 100 years old. And it, when we moved in 34 years ago, it was extremely inefficient. And so uh, over the years, we made minor improvements. But then eight years ago, we did what's called a deep energy retrofit, which means we completely renovated the house, which needed to be done anyway. And while we were doing that, we put in much more insulation than building code required and much better windows than building code required. We tightened the building envelope to reduce the exfiltration of air that we've heated in the winter or cooled in the summer. Uh, by a factor of 90% reduction, LED lighting everywhere, high efficiency appliances everywhere. We completely eliminated the natural gas that was heating and making hot water for us. We put in air source heat pumps made by Fujitsu and we put solar on our roof. Eight and a half years later, we have made 30% more energy than we have used. So that means my house is now a power plant. And I have no heating bill. I have no electric bill. My surplus energy gives me a credit with the electric utility that as of last month was $5,400. And my annual surplus is so large that last year we bought electric vehicles. My wife has one and I have one. And we can power them for free with 100% green electrons. And I get paid every time we make a megawatt hour of solar and we make 12 or 13 a year. So that's several thousand dollars more. So it's extremely cost effective. In fact, it's profitable to do this. And um, a great many houses and apartments in the world can be retrofitted in that way. And by the way, for low-income people, it improves their health because low-income people who can't afford in the winter to pay their heating bills will turn the heat down. In other words, they have to choose between heating and eating. And the result is they get sick more often. They're going to get more pneumonia, more bronchitis. Their, their chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, gets worse. They have more um, acute episodes of complications from diabetes and heart disease and other health problems, which is terrible and actually increases uh, mortality, but also is very expensive for the healthcare system. And by retrofitting low-income housing, you can eliminate many of those healthcare burdens and all of that money that can now go into more economic growth. Go ahead, we have a question over here. Actually, two questions. David, why don't you go ahead and then we'll... I'm just going to make a comment that some states have charged you for the energy that you save because their argument is that the investment in the, in the electric companies to generate power now, they don't need it. So that, there's a political process that has to be to handled with care. Absolutely right. And uh, in Massachusetts, where I live, I get, uh, I get credited the same price per kilowatt hour when I'm putting power into the grid as when I use it. So net metering, and it's really great. But in Australia, you get charged at the retail rate. You get paid at the wholesale rate. Right. And what that does is it creates an incentive for everybody to get batteries in Australia, which is happening. So it's a serious issue, but uh, more and more, we're moving in the right direction. I had one question, which maybe you can answer rapidly. 
Suppose I decided that I, what I'm going to do is get rid of all data processing, all cloud storage, all internet, etc., which uh, all cyber currency. What would that do to the uh, global? So that's a great question, and uh, I think it's true that the fastest growing source of uh, electric power demand is data centers, including Bitcoin mining yeah. and other cryptocurrency mm -hmm. mining. Uh, any bit, any crypto that's proof of work is very, very damaging to the environment. Um, the model isn't granular enough to look at that, but I think it's a serious problem. And if you have a big enough carbon price, you're going to penalize any region of the world that's using fossil, gas, or coal to make electricity. And already the Bitcoin miners are trying to locate where power is cheap. They're going to move then to where power is cheap and green it still is a problem. And even if there wasn't Bitcoin mining, you know, there's a serious conversation we ought to have that we're not gonna be able to do today about is it really important for you to have all your photographs on Instagram of the lunches you've had 10 years ago still available at the click of a button, mm -hmm. which means that there's a data center that keeps it ready to go, using power and polluting the environment, is that really important? And I'm not going to give my personal answer to that, but, you know, there's a serious question there. Are you willing to have the climate deteriorate and compromise your future just so you can have uh, a lot of followers on Instagram that uh, can look at what you were doing when you were uh, young and stupid? <laughs> Let's put it that way. Okay, well, 2.5 degrees, we're making progress. Energy efficiency is a very high leverage policy. Ah, yes, we have another question here. I, ha I have a question. Where in the model is district heating or heating in general? Because you just said that uh, I should have a heat pump and so on. For instance, in Europe, many people complain about uh, heat pumps and they said that before, for instance, using gas was cheaper uh, for them. But what about, for instance, elderly people and so on? And in US, under PurePa, for instance, district heating was also very popular. CHPs, for instance, highly uh, efficient CHPs units, where they are in the model? So uh, that would be included in uh, energy efficiency and electrification. And district heating by ground source heat pumps is something that's being used more and more around the world, and even in the United States, uh, it's, uh, it's being tried out in more places. Ground source heat pumps are also very effective. I have several members of my family who live in Minnesota. This is a very cold climate. Uh, just recently, it was minus 20 C in Minnesota, and their houses are very nicely warm all year round with ground source heat pumps. District heating for urban areas with ground source heat pumps is, I think, a very good option, and that's included in the sliders that we've just pulled for energy efficiency and electrification. Okay, we still have some more progress to do, so what else would make a big difference? Go ahead. You want to save the forests. Yes, I think All Brazil right. made some progress recently, so uh, right. let's see how that works. So let's look at deforestation. So in our base case, deforestation peaks in the next decade and then gradually falls. And in our current scenario, it actually falls a little bit faster. Why? Because 2.5 is enough below 3.3 that crop yields are higher than they were in the baseline. And that means fewer hectares of the Amazon, of Indonesia, of other parts of the world, the Congo, have to be cleared in order to grow food. So already we see some of the unanticipated benefits of the carbon price and the other actions far away in the world. We're improving crop yield for smallhold farmers in Africa. That's great. But we still have a massive deforestation problem. Here we are at 2.49. Let's see what happens if we accelerate the reduction in deforestation. So maybe something like that. So now we're at 2.39. That's another tenth of a degree. Every tenth of a degree matters. This is really important. So great. 2.4. What else can we do that can help lower the warming? Yes. Please. Uh, 
I want to see how it works when you increase the nuclear power. Increase nuclear power. Fantastic. Let's find out what it does for us. So first of all, let's see what's happening with nuclear now. So in the base case, that's the black line. And in the current scenario, nuclear actually increases until about 2070, and then it's slightly lower. So why is that? Well, when you price carbon, you're making nuclear more attractive because coal-fired electric and gas-powered electric become more expensive. So solar and wind grow, but also nuclear grows a little bit. And then it becomes um, a little lower towards the end because the renewables just get so, so cheap that it squeezes out. So here you can see the marginal cost of all the different ways to make electric power. And already today, green is renewables, that's wind and solar. Uh, brown is carbon, is coal, and nuclear is the light blue here. And nuclear is much more expensive already today than renewables. In fact, wind and solar, unsubsidized, are cheaper in many parts of the world with storage than every other way to make electric power. It's just been so much technical progress. And uh, in many parts of the world, it's cheaper to design, permit, build a new utility-scale solar farm than it is to operate an existing coal-fired power plant. And that's why so many of them are going out of business. So let's now see what happens if we subsidize nuclear. So what I'm going to do is, uh, so we need the uh, energy mix. Here's nuclear. And what I can do is incentivize even more nuclear by tax credits, low interest loans, loan guarantees, indemnification against risks, government covering waste disposal costs, and so forth. Things we can do. And so let's see what happens. We are at 2.39. And I'm going to subsidize massively. Seven cents per kilowatt hour. This is a really, really big subsidy. So does it work? Well, we get a lot more nuclear, a lot more. When we briefed with the Nuclear Industry Association and they asked for this first, they looked at this and said, that's really optimistic compared even to our most aggressive scenarios. Now the question is, since we have much more nuclear, and you can see it here, did it actually matter to the climate? Barely at all. Where were we? We were at 2.39, heavy subsidy on nuclear, 2.35, 0 0.04 climate benefit. Why? Why doesn't it matter? Yeah, it's similar to the hydrogen and fusion story you're squeezing out more of the renewables. And you can see that if you look at the green wedge and also the bioenergy wedge is getting smaller. So without nuclear, much more renewables. With nuclear, squeeze out some fossil and a lot of renewables because renewables towards the out years of the century are the dominant source of electric power. So again, cannibalizing your other zero carbon sources. Nuclear is very, very expensive, and it also takes a long time to build. And so this is a low leverage policy that's very costly. You could take the money that you're using to subsidize the nuclear industry and build even more solar and wind and storage facilities even faster at much lower cost. So would you like to keep it in or take it out? Take it out. All right. So that still leaves us at 2.4 something. What else do you want to try here? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, OK. Work on the methane, the fluorinated gases, and the nitrous oxide. So you can see that by about 2050 and then going forward, the carbon dioxide emissions are getting smaller. They're not zero, but they're getting much smaller. And that means that these other gases become the dominant drivers of climate change. So let's work on that. So over here, you can see their emissions are already somewhat lower in, in your scenario. That's because with much lower demand for fossil fuels, there's lower what we call fugitive emissions of methane from the energy supply chain. 
And uh, so that's already a benefit. But we can do more if we had policies that could reduce the methane, the uh, nitrous oxide, and the fluorinated gases. And you can do this with looking at agriculture, which is mostly methane and N2O, or industry separately. But let's just do it all together. And uh, let's cut it by about half. It's not going to be easy to cut it all the way to zero. But now you're at 2.1, 2.14. We're getting very close. What else? So this is very important. This is a high leverage policy. Remember, methane is more powerful than CO2 and has a shorter lifetime in the atmosphere. So if you can cut the emissions of methane, it has a quicker climate benefit. So what else do we need to work on here? Yeah, go ahead. Plant a billion trees. OK, let's uh, plant a trillion trees. This is known as the Trillion Tree Campaign. Trillion. Yep, and uh, so this is afforestation. We've already reduced deforestation, and we saw it was beneficial. Now let's plant a trillion trees. That's a lot of trees. And we're now at 2.03. Is this feasible, and what does it do? Well, this is the amount of carbon dioxide in green that's being removed by the trees you're planting. And it becomes a large amount, about 5 billion tons per year. But it takes until about 2060 for that to happen. How come? Trees take a long time to grow. They take a long time to grow. Have any, have any of you here ever participated in a tree planting program and gone out into the field and planted new trees? Yeah, I have done it myself. When you planted the trees, how big were the trees you were planting? Uh, the tiny, the tiny? Yeah, when you planted them. How big? How tall? Oh, now it's big. But when you planted it, how big was it? Yeah, it was like this. It had almost no leaves, right? Because you're planting a little tiny sapling that was grown in a, in a greenhouse. No leaves. So every year, it's not doing anything much to, to pull carbon out of the air. Depending on the species, depending on what climate you're planting them in, it can take 60, 80, 100 years for those trees to mature. And in the meantime, still burning fossil fuels, right? So this is uh, something that where it's possible, it's a good thing to do. I personally like to get out in the forest and hike as often as I can. This, when, where we can plant trees, we should, but it is not a silver bullet for the climate crisis, and it takes a lot of land. A trillion trees, well, the dashed line here, that's the total land area of India. John, I think there's a serious debate about is there really enough land to do this without compromising land for agriculture, food production. Very difficult question. But there's a student. Yeah, we have a question or a suggestion. Let's see what else we can do. We're at two degrees. We need to do better. OK, because I think maybe the technological maybe is very useful for this. Scenario. Technological carbon dioxide removal? Yeah. OK, so that's over here. We have. Uh, I think five different options here, uh, including we have already some bioenergy with carbon capture. Direct air capture, mineralization, natural solutions, including agricultural sequestration, and biochar. Uh, which one do you want to try? I want to try the architecture, so carbon. Which? Air capture. OK. This is called DAC, or direct air capture. There are several pilot plants operating right now. There's Climeworks, there's uh, plants in Iceland and Canada. They're operating very low scale and it's very, very expensive today. There's no guarantee that it'll scale up, but they, they're optimistic. So let's see what would happen if we increase it. We're at two degrees. Uh, if we can you know, get it up to three quarters of its potential, it helps a little bit. It's very expensive. No guarantee it'll work, helps a little bit. What about, uh, well, mineralization is much more speculative, uh, but what about natural solutions? This would be no-till and low-till agriculture, cover crops, uh, recycling as fertilizer, the manure from livestock, um, and other natural solutions that would build up the stock of carbon in the soils instead of depleting it. So let's see, this is something we can do today. It's hard to verify, but we can do it today. So let's see what would happen if we do. Maybe about three quarters of the potential, just like before. Now we're at one point, we're at 1.9. That's great. 
What else might we try or do a little more of that might get us well below two degrees? You know, you have to remember there's uncertainty. 1.94, that's expected warming, but it could be worse, right? Maybe the planet is more fragile and we go over some tipping points. We ought to have a safety buffer, so let's see if we can get a little lower. Was there a suggestion? Yeah, please. Did, did you just say that if there's no other plans, then high temperatures get down? Great. So first of all, I think this is great. This is by far the best lecture I've ever had on this topic, and I would encourage wow. you to set up a circle of ambassadors and do this in high school. Because the young people who get out to vote the next year or the following years, they need to work with this and they need to get it more tangible. So first of all, thank you for that and I hope you can build on that. I'm interested to see what happens if you decrease population and then I'd like to see a discussion on what is possible and how we make decisions in our society. Okay, well, so first of all, thank you. and. Um, we are actually working to build networks of ambassadors who can run this simulation everywhere in the world, including in high schools, and we can talk about that in a minute. Uh, now, population. So how would you slow down population growth? If you can accelerate economic growth in developing countries, then there will be lower population growth, because that's a common transition. Right, so you're referring to what's called the demographic transition, which is the transition from a agricultural, low-income society where children are wealth and so you need lots of children. Um, they can contribute positively to your household's income as soon as they're old enough to fetch water and wood for the fire. Um, as we get into a more industrialized, post-industrial society, children are no longer contributors to your household's income and they may never be and then they graduate from college and move back into your basement. So. Um, that's the classical economic perspective. But since it's very difficult to accelerate economic growth, although we'll talk about that in a second, the way to slow down population growth that's widely understood to be successful is to invest in empowering and educating women and girls. More education for girls, especially in many developed country, developing countries where they're not going to school, where they uh, are, uh, entering marriage, uh, often arranged at very early ages, uh, working to empower women so they have choice and control over their future, their bodies, providing better health care, not just access to family planning, but just better health care in general. It's proven to reduce fertility because then people don't need to have as many children because infant mortality is lower and they, uh, Women choose then to delay the onset of childbearing and have smaller families. So this is a good thing to do in general because it's good for human rights, it's good for women's rights, it's good for gender equity, it's good for all kinds of things. There are several of the UN Sustainable Development Goals that speak directly to these issues. So it's a wonderful thing to do in its own right. Now the question is, what would it do to benefit the climate? So how much might it reduce future population? Very much debated but probably not even as much as a billion. I mean, 2.3 billion more people between now and 2100 per the UN. What if that was to fall by an entire billion? That's way beyond what most people think is feasible. And you can see the difference it makes. What difference did it make to the climate? Well, we started here at 1.94 massive reduction in fertility and population growth, 1.9. It's a very low leverage climate action. How come? Two main reasons. First, you can see right here that it doesn't begin to slow down population until the second half of the century. Think about it. Almost all the people who are going to have children in the next 20 years have already been born. So there's enormous inertia in the population structure slows down the benefit. And the other reason it doesn't have more climate impact is it's primarily affecting population in the developing world. But that is where carbon footprints today are the lowest because these are the people with the least economic 
resources. So they're not driving a lot, they're not flying, they're not burning a lot of fossil fuel right now, and so you don't see much reduction in, uh, in, uh, in emissions. So it's a good thing to do, let's leave it in this scenario, but it's not a climate action with high leverage. Well, we're at 1.9, I wanna leave a little bit of time for conversation with you. How could we do even better? Well, let's put that carbon price up closer to the European level. Let's put it up to $100 a ton and give all the money back, 1.7, 1.75. There's other things you might want to be a little more aggressive about, but I'll leave that for you. And one of the things I'll do is I'm going to capture this scenario, and I will email it to our hosts, and they can make it available for all of you. So you can just click on the link. You'll see this scenario. Use whatever language you like and see if you want to change it, tweak it, make it better. Or just go to the simulation, as many of you have been doing, and try it on your own. But let me try to wrap it up and ask the question that came up earlier, which is, well, what is this going to do economically? A lot of people look at this and they say, it's going to cost a lot, and we can't afford it. But that's only looking at the short-run costs. What will the benefits be? Well, there's already enormous benefits in many areas. Ocean acidification could actually stop and then slowly get better. That would be great for people who live in, uh, from the sea. Air pollution, the PM 2.5 emissions are gonna go down and they go down really quickly as you drive the coal and the oil and the gas out of the system. That saves lives, lowers healthcare costs, and all of the, improves labor productivity, and all of those economic benefits can go into strengthening your economy. What about some of the other impacts of climate change? We won't go through them all, but fewer people are gonna die from extreme heat. Um, crop yields are still gonna fall, but not nearly as much, so agricultural output is higher. Food insecurity is lower. Forced migration because of drought and starvation will be reduced. The risks of civil conflict and international conflict are reduced. Enormously beneficial, saving lives, helping the economy, and then, we can, you can look at all the others, but let's take a look at temperature staying well under two degrees. What happens to the economy? Economic growth is much higher than it would have been. And when you run the numbers, the net present value of this future is positive, meaning it costs something in the short run, like any investment you spend up front, but then the benefits outweigh that. This is too attractive economically, socially, politically not to do. So congratulations, you've created a much safer, healthier, more resilient, prosperous, and equitable world for yourselves, your children, and all the children. That's really important. Because a lot of people come in today into the climate change debate and they're depressed. They say, it's too late. There's nothing we can do. There's nothing I can do. And so I just feel depressed. Or I go into denial. It's not as bad as they say. Something will happen. Somebody's going to invent fusion or some other magic technology that's going to solve the problem. That's just cognitive dissonance reduction. You don't like that tension, so you come up with some story you can tell yourself to make yourself feel a little bit better. If we believe that, disaster awaits. Instead, at the beginning, Dr. Doom maybe scared you a little bit. That's good, because we're on the wrong path. Now, take a look at what you've chosen. You chose these things, not me. Every one of these things is feasible with today's technology. We can put a price on carbon today, and in fact, many countries already do. We can increase programs that boost energy efficiency. We can take the coal out of the system. We can do everything you've done here with what we know how to do today, plus routine scale economies, learning by doing, and R&D. No technological magic required. It's not gonna be automatic. It's not gonna be something that happens because somebody else does it for you. This is only gonna happen 
if everybody here stands up, takes action in your personal life, in your professional life, and in your political life, by which I mean as a citizen, getting out there to pressure your government to do the right thing. It's absolutely doable, but it requires effort. This is good news. We can solve this problem. It's not too late. Time is very short. If we wait 10 years, too late. We've got to do it right away. But we can still do it. It requires every one of you to stand up and make a difference in everything you do, personally, professionally, and as a citizen. This is good news. If the laws of physics told us that it's too late and there's nothing we can do, there's no negotiating with the laws of physics. Politically, this is still an enormous challenge, but it can be done. We need you to stand up and make it happen. It's not going to be easy, but it's going to be worth it. So everybody get up and let's get going. Thanks an awful lot, folks. I really appreciate your efforts today. Thank you very much for this very, very, very powerful message that you've sent. Uh, let me invite uh, Kazataka to uh, make a final concluding remark. Can I? Oh. Oh. Thank you. Thank you, um, Professor Stan, for coming all over to Japan and Keio University. Um, I, I was in a chair of the Japanese government digital disaster prevention team a few years ago. And I've been thinking about this problem quite a lot. And uh, when I encountered NROs a few years ago, it's so surprising, so interactive, so, so easy to understand. So we loved it. And um, well, how we, should, we should use this, yeah, this tool um, for whatever education we should do in, in Japan too. And um, well, as we have learned by playing with this model, um, achieving a sustainable goal for the future is very, very difficult. It's highly complex. Not a single lever would not fix. And it's, it's basically the revision of our system itself. So changing the system in a 10, 20 years to a couple of decades is really almost impossible, but no, we really have to do it because our kids and our offsprings, all those people will be here for a f centuries, for sure, right? So uh, for doing that, um, maybe, well, we should be aware we can change the future and uh, how, by, yeah, and also we should know how to deal with it. But what the beauty of this enroads is you can change the future in a second, right? <laughs> that's, that's an amazing thing. And uh, how, but now what depressed me is you know, whatever I try, you know, as my, what I, what I could achieve so far is you know, 1.3 degrees. <laughs> so, yeah, it's almost a uh, uh, reset of our system. Yeah, and uh, probably the likely op most optimistic target is you know, two degrees or somewhere around that, probably. Um, but um, what I have learned from the, this En-ROADS uh, session is, well, we can let a bunch of people understand what we can do, not by forcing them to do, 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 do. Instead, let them play with it. <laughs> then they can feel whatever they can feel, uh, would like to do for the future. So thank you very much for providing us an opportunity to learn how to change the future in a, such a gentle and a kind and a nice, nicer way. And, uh, and I thank you so much for coming all over to Japan. And I thank you, uh, Professor Kokryo, for <laughs> inviting me to here too. And uh, I hope all of you guys enjoyed a lot and uh, you learned a lot. 
please spread the word about the N-Words. <laughs> and uh, let's pray with it and uh, think about the future and uh, do whatever we want to do and uh, for the future generations. Now, thank you so much. Thank you. So please, uh, please join me in uh, thanking uh, Professor Sturman again and uh, Professor Takagi. Thank you very much.